It's been written about in thousands of books, from official histories to personal memoirs. Statues and monuments to the courage and high ideals that emanated from it have been erected around the world. The voices of veterans have been recorded so they can speak to us from the grave. It was the first war captured on film, and supposedly it was a gentleman's war. Fought between an empire at the height of its power and two tiny republics. It was the South African War, otherwise known as the Anglo-Boer War. And it began 100 years ago. It seems an unlikely place for a pivotal event in world history. An event that marked the end of an era and forged a nation. But here at Sunspreit, just outside Folkswrist, a hundred years ago, 5,000 men awaited a decision that would change their lives and the lives of thousands around the world. A few days earlier, their president, Paul Kruger, had issued an ultimatum of war to Britain. At five o'clock on the 11th of October, 1899, the ultimatum was rejected in London, and the most powerful empire in the world was at war with the two tiny republics of the Transvaal and the Orange Free State. The soldiers of the republics surged across the border at Fortress into what was then the British colony of Natal. They were called Boers because many of them were farmers. Their plan had been well thought out. Their main target in Natal was Ladysmith. At the time, it was the main railway center and military headquarters in the northern part of the colony. Once in control there, they would sweep onto Durban and take the port. In the Cape, the Boers would take Kimberley, Freiburg, and Mafeking. Free State commandos would strike at Colesburg, Alawal North, and Stormburg. They would then move on to Cape Town. With the ports in their hands, British reinforcements would be unable to land, and the Boers hoped Britain would then negotiate. It was a bold plan, and if carried out quickly enough, it might have worked. Sunrise on the 20th of October, 1899. Above the small coal mining town of Dundee in northern Natal, mist swirled around the hilltops. Although today Dundee has fallen on hard times with the closure of most of its mines and industries, in 1899 it was a major centre. It had its own stock exchange and more than 300 coal mines operated in the area. Dundee coal was crucial to keeping Britain's fleet operating on the route to India. To protect this vital arm of the empire, 4,500 men under General Penn Simons were sent to Dundee to defend the town. Unbeknown to them, during the night, General Erasmus had taken up position with 4,000 men on Imparti Mountain, northwest of Dundee. Using a farmhouse on the other side of town as his base, General Lucas Mayer had dragged artillery up Talana Hill. From here, the Boers had a perfect view of the British camp on the far side of town. The second Boer shell landed just outside Penn Simon's tent, but didn't explode. Confusion reigned in the British camp for a few minutes. The artillery batteries were limbered up and moved to within range of Talana. Cavalry was sent around to Lana to cut off any retreating Boers. The infantry was ordered into a frontal attack on the hill. A wall on Talana was perfect cover for the Boers. As the British moved towards the mountain, a number of men were hit by long-range fire. Most reached the eucalyptus plantation where the Talana Museum now stands. Here they hid from the hail of bullets but heavy fire started pouring down from Lennox Hill on the right. As the bullets tore leaves from the trees, the smell of eucalyptus mixed with the smell of blood. More than 70 years later, some of the survivors would still recall the smell vividly. There was nothing for it but to press on to the low wall below the farmhouse. Here, the British were pinned down for some time and the battle ground to a halt. At the uh, 200 yards, when you had to stand up with these Enfield rifles and shoot, standing up, I was shooting badly at the 200 yards, but lying down, 
and shipped it to 500 yards, I was putting on bull's eyes. Annoyed that his troops were pinned down, Penn Simons rode to where his monument now stands to urge them on. A bullet from the top of the hill entered his stomach, and he retired mortally wounded. Some British soldiers moved towards Talana through a donga that gave them cover. But when the donga ran out, many men were killed. In it. Through devastating fire from the Boers, the British reached a low wall on Talana. And then their problems really began. Their own artillery started shelling them. This was the first battle in which the British had worn khaki, and the gunners couldn't tell their men apart from the Boers. As the battle raged, volunteer Indian stretcher bearers, organized by Gandhi, ferried the wounded to the hospital. Finally, as more and more British troops poured across the plateau, Mayer gave the order to withdraw. Erasmus, over on Impati, had not participated in the battle at all. But he hadn't been entirely ineffective. He had watched the British cavalry move behind Talana. He ordered his men to give chase. They chased them to the Maritz farm, which they hoped would provide a safe refuge until nightfall. The cavalry took cover in a barn and in the kopi behind it. When the Boers brought in a pom-pom, the men surrendered. At Talana, the British lost 250 men, the Boers only 30. Three days later, Penn Simons was buried in Dundee, and the new British commander abandoned the town. The Boers quickly claimed Dundee, and the looting started. The town was renamed Mayersdorf in honor of General Mayer. Street names like General Joubert, Greats, Vormerantz, and President Kruger became the order of the day. When the British prisoners of war arrived in Pretoria, it seemed nothing stood in the way of the Boers taking control of Natal. The republics had no regular armies. All English and Afrikaans-speaking white males between the ages of 16 and 60 were liable for service. Each electoral district formed its own commander. My feelings when I left with my father were very heavy-hearted, very heavy-hearted. My heart was heavy because I was a young child. I was taken out of school. How do you say it? I was a boy and rode around on a lovely horse to see the girls. You understand? And those things were over, and I had to go to join the commando. In total, the republics had about 55,000 fighting men. A number of Africans rode with the Boers as achterreivers. They looked after the horses, set up camp, loaded ammunition, and dug trenches. Each republic had a small professional artillery corps trained by German instructors. Their artillery outranged anything the British had in South Africa at the start of the war. Many foreign mercenaries offered their services to President Kruger. They were Irish, American, Italian, Russian, Danish, French and Dutch units. This was essentially a European war fought on African soil. Uh, it's Europeans who started the war, it's Europeans who managed the war and it's Europeans who decided the way in which the war should be ended and that the majority black population had some role to play but certainly had no influence or power over, um, over the running and the outcome of the war. When the war was declared, there was panic in Johannesburg to get away. Over 130,000 people left in September alone. Johannesburg and Pretoria became ghost towns. To avoid starvation, thousands of miners returned home. The gold mines of Johannesburg closed down. In one incident, 8,000 miners left Johannesburg in a colorful cavalcade on the heels of the Boer army. The man who organized their safe passage later had a Peter Maritzburg road named after him. As refugees flooded into Durban and Cape Town, the populations of both towns grew overnight. Some colonists joined the volunteer corps. There was plenty of work for Africans in both armies. Some were conscripted for employment in the commanders where they received no pay, but were provided with rations and allowed to keep a portion of any loot that came their way. It paid. If you join the police forces, you got the money for it. That's number one. Number two, the other thing is that the boys didn't have any uniforms. Sometimes they didn't even give the guns 
But the English had all the uniforms. They would dress you up. They would have even the, the gun and everything and uniform. And that did leave a bit of a respect to you. About halfway between Ladysmith and Dundee is the small railway siding of Ilanslachter. It was an important railway junction connecting the coast to the coal mines. While the Battle of Talana raged, Boers occupied the station. When a train carrying a supply of whiskey was captured, a wild party ensued with the Boers and their prisoners singing, God Save the Queen. On the ridge, just behind the station, where they would have a commanding view, the Boers made their stronghold. Guns were dragged into position and a series of defensive walls were built. The only problem was the Boers were expecting an attack from Dundee, but that had already fallen. Their defences were facing the wrong way. The British cavalry headed out from Ladysmith, followed by the infantry. At three o'clock that afternoon, the artillery bombardment started. The infantry marched directly across the open plain towards the Boers on the ridge. The Boers fired thousands of rounds at the advancing troops, but their open formation meant few men were hit. Halfway up the slope, the British ran into a barbed wire fence. Many men were killed here in the 15 minutes it took to cut their way through it. The stones the British piled around their bodies as they lay under fire on the slopes are still visible at Ilanslachter today. By five o'clock, the tide had turned for the Boers, and the British took the hill. The surviving Boers rode down the back of the hill and crossed the railway line. It was here that the cavalry caught them. More than 40 Boers were killed and over 100 wounded as the lancers and sabres cut through them. Down at the station, the Boer wives who had accompanied their husbands to war waited for news. They were soon to discover that the party was over. Everyone had a different excuse as to why the war had started. But it can probably be traced back to 1886. That year, the greatest deposit of gold the world had ever known was discovered in the Zuid-Afrikaanse Republiek, or the Transvaal, as it later became known. It lay deep underground, and extracting it required specialist knowledge. Johannesburg was the city that sprung up on the new gold fields. A thousand wagons a day poured into the new boom town. A stock exchange opened, along with bars, gambling dens and brothels. Communities sprang up around the city in response to the demand for labour. To most Boers, Johannesburg was a place of evil. Their capital, Pretoria, only 60 kilometers away, was another world. But the gold brought problems as well as prosperity. In the late 1800s, the world was moving towards the gold standard. This meant paper currency was guaranteed by National Bank's gold holdings. From Britain's point of view, the 700 million pounds generated each year by the Transvaal mines would go a long way towards enriching the empire. The capitalists stirred the pot using voting rights of foreigners in the Transvaal. This was a sensitive issue because foreigners outnumbered Boers. If they got the vote, they could take over the country. There were meetings, riots and even some deaths. Convinced that Britain was intent on destroying their republic, the Boers built a ring of forts around Pretoria. Fort Klapperkorp was one. Another fort was built in Johannesburg. Military hardware was secretly imported through contacts in Lorenzo Marx. My great-grandfather, he was the forwarding agent in Dundee because the railway line stops here and his job was to unload the supplies from the railway line and then on his ox wagons transport them through to their final destination. And he became a bit concerned because he was forever transporting barrels of molasses through to the Transvaal and felt that this was a bit odd. He hadn't been sending that many through beforehand and so he opened some of these barrels and found that they were full of rifles. To avert war, a conference was called in Bloemfontein in May 1899. It was attended by President Kruger and the governor of the Cape Colony, Sir Alfred Milner. He was a man with friends in high places and well aware of what the Transvaal's gold could do for the empire. 
each party put their case forward. Milner called for more voting rights, but Kruger saw through him. The conference that had been called to guarantee peace ended by guaranteeing war. In Britain, everyone was confident the war would be over by Christmas. But just to make sure things went their way, to defeat the Boers, the British sent the biggest and best equipped army ever to leave their shores. To tell you the truth, it was, I looked forward to the change of occupation altogether. That's what I look for. I wanted to be a soldier. No, when we left here, we weren't in favor of the war. We had confidence that President Krieger and General Erasmus and those people would calm the situation. And so we were downhearted, man, because of what was going to happen to us. But there was some surprising support for the Boers. John Jabavu, the editor of an African newspaper, was critical of Britain's standpoint from the beginning. This was embarrassing because one of the arguments used by Britain to support the war was the Transvaal's handling of race relations. Jabavu became so vociferous, the British military authorities closed his newspaper down. A Swazi delegation visited Paul Kruger to offer their help. The offer was turned down because both sides had decided this would be a white man's war. To the west of Pretoria lay the small town of Mafeking. It had a small British garrison and the railway line to Rhodesia ran through here. To block Rhodesian reinforcements arriving, the Boers surrounded the town two days after the war started. But they had been led into a trap. Inside the town, facing them, was Baden Powell, a British officer who'd been sent to Mafeking to get the town besieged. Keeping the Boers occupied at Mafeking would give the main British force time to reach Cape Town. Baden Powell fortified the town. To bolster his forces, he formed a regiment of Baralong men, which became known as the Black Watch. This annoyed the Boers intensely, as they felt Baden Powell wasn't playing by the rules. Without the Cape Boys, as they were called, and the, and the Baralongs and the other black people in the siege, the, the Mafeking King would have fallen in two weeks, but that's never acknowledged. Even the British government wouldn't acknowledge it, wouldn't give medals to them after the war. The Boers started shelling the town into submission. The locals dug bomb shelters and settled down to life that was conducted underground. Further south down the railway line was Kimberley, a town that had particular significance for the Free State Boers. It was originally part of the Free State, but the British had redrawn the maps and claimed it and its diamond fields for the Empire. The Boers surrounded Kimberley, placing their artillery on the mine dumps. Along with 4,000 British troops who were trapped in the town was one of the most powerful men in South Africa, Cecil John Rhodes. He was staying in what is today the McGregor Museum. The Boers fired over 7,000 shells into Kimberley. Homes and hotels were hit, but the residents soon learned to live with the threat. The average citizen decided this was an enjoyable occasion. It was fun, it was different, it was something new to write letters home about, it was something new to keep a diary about. And you get invitations sent out that, uh, for concert parties and weather and Boers permitting. One of the biggest challenges facing the town was supplying food for everyone. Prices in the shops went through the roof. Horses were slaughtered and distributed. Road started a soup kitchen for poorer members of the community, but even this wasn't enough. At one time, the infant mortality rate amongst the black and brown community was over 900 per thousand. So that over at one time, over 950 uh, out of a thousand children born would have been dying. The first person to be killed by a shell was an African woman in front of St. Mary's Cathedral. As was practiced those days, her name was not recorded. To respond to the bombardment, the British only had small guns. An American engineer working for De Beers, George Labram, decided to do something about the situation. 
he designed a gun that was forged in the De Beers workshop and finished on a lathe that is still used today. The gun, which was nicknamed Long Cecil, fired shells over seven kilometers. The Boers responded by mounting their biggest gun, a Long Tom, on a mine dump outside the town. Ironically, one of the first people it killed was George Labram himself. Today, the Long Cecil stands on the honored dead memorial in the center of Kimberley. Two weeks after the war started, General Buller and 47,000 members of the British Army arrived in Cape Town. To relieve the sieges, he decided to split his forces. One half would tackle the Boers in the Cape, the other half would push them out of Natal. Buller would lead the Natal force. But moving an army the size of Buller's was no easy task. Food, medical supplies and clothing had to be transported. Thousands of ox wagons, oxen and drivers had to be hired. A large contingent of journalists and photographers traveled with the troops. Some even had a new device called the bioscope camera with them. By the time the British arrived at Belmont in the middle of the Karoo, after traveling through some of the hottest and most inhospitable country the soldiers had ever seen, the Boers were waiting for them. The hilltops behind Belmont Station were a natural defensive position. A road had been cut up one of the hills and a gun dragged into position. From the farm alongside the main road, the British approach started at two o'clock in the morning. It was two-pronged, with one force moving along the railway line and the other straight towards the hills. The Boers first noticed the British moving towards them about two hours later. By this time, the British artillery had started pounding their position with shrapnel, making it difficult for them to fire at the troops. From every ridge, bullets poured down into the British ranks. There was very little cover, and Karoo Kopis aren't the easiest terrain to run up either. By the time the British scaled the ridges, the Boers were trotting away into the distance on their horses. They didn't face up to it. They, they would run away, you know, they always on their own. That was our trouble, we couldn't keep up with them. Belmont was won by the British at high cost. 54 men had been killed and over 240 wounded. Men considered themselves lucky to have been hit by a Mauser bullet that made a clean hole and not a Martini Henry that could blow one apart. The British left men behind to guard Belmont for the duration of the war, and today their graffiti shares the rocks with that of Bushman artists from thousands of years ago. Over on the Natal front, at Ladysmith, the British garrison had started having problems of its own. The Boers had surrounded the town and mounted guns on the hills. In town, there were 14,000 troops and about 8,000 civilians. There was enough food to feed everyone for three months. The ridge alongside the town, known as Wagon Hill, was in British hands. It had been fortified and gave them a vantage point from which to view the Boer positions. The bombardment continued from Monday till Saturday during daylight hours. Few buildings were spared. Even the British headquarters was hit. On the pavement outside the Royal Hotel one day, one of the town's doctors was immortalized when he was killed by a bomb. He had a stray cat with him in his arms. Another shell came from Mbulwana, was fired by the Boers of the Long Tom, came through the window here, by where Dr. Stark was standing at that spot. He took off both his legs, and while we were lying on the floor waiting for help to, let's name it, he was more concerned about uh, his stray cat that he had in his hand. The All Saints Church was struck by a shell that went through the roof and destroyed a wall. The hole in the roof is still there and the shell is mounted into the wall. To warn the town's inhabitants when a Long Tom shell was coming, Pabu Singh, a labourer from Dundee, stood on Wagon Hill and waved a large red flag when he saw a puff of smoke from Mbulwana. <laughs> 
When the townsfolk saw the flag, they had about 20 seconds to find cover. The Clip River, running through town, became a refuge for many civilians who dug bomb shelters into its banks. Some black men earned enormous sums of money carrying messages hidden in their clothing in and out of town. If caught by either side, however, they ran the risk of being shot. From time to time, the British sent out small forces to attack the Boer positions. One of these attacks ended with 20 men dying. On another occasion, the Boers attacked the British on Wagon Hill late one night. Wagon Hill was very heavy to attack because the slopes are so, so high. They climb up and then you really uh, right into the trenches. It lasted all day, right from dawn till about five o'clock that afternoon. Then a heavy storm of rain and thunder came down so that one really couldn't see uh, 20 or 30 yards in front of you. So heavy was that downpour. The Boers were eventually pushed back, and Ladysmith survived to fight another day. From the Boers' point of view, the sieges made war seem like fun. They simply fired a few shots into town and otherwise relaxed in camp. Families came to visit, but it was a major tactical error. The momentum of their war had been lost, and it would cost them dearly. It's only afterwards that uh, I learned more about warfare and so on, that I could see the mistakes, the very great mistakes, which were made right from the outset of the war. As a matter of fact, one can almost say the war was lost at the Battle of Dundee. The war was lost at the Battle of Colenso. The war was lost at the Battle of Svyunsko. Looking back, because we did not make a desperate effort to once and for all destroy the enemy once they were defeated. Too much Christianity and too much democracy was the causes which lost the war to the Boer forces. During the early stages of the war, before the mounted infantry became common, the British relied heavily on the railway to transport troops and supplies. This made it easy for the Boers to assess the army's movements and the railway became the target of many attacks. To counter the problem, armoured trains were introduced. Filled with troops, these patrolled the lines to deal with any Boers causing trouble. But the Boers soon learned to deal with them. Just after the siege of Ladysmith began, an armoured train incident took place alongside the old Durban-Johannesburg road that would go down in history. On board the train was a young man who would one day become the Prime Minister of Britain, Winston Churchill. The train was on its way back to escort, having done a routine patrol, but Boers were waiting for it. As it thundered past, they fired from the embankment. The driver accelerated and hit a pile of rocks placed on the line further down the hill. After the derailment, a number of prisoners were taken, including Churchill. He later escaped from prison in Pretoria. A reward was put on his head while he made a long trip through the Eastern Transvaal to Lorenzo Marx. He then caught a ship to Durban to reach the battlefront again. It was an adventure that didn't harm his popularity in later years. For both armies, helping injured soldiers was a challenge. Dutch, French and Russian medical teams offered their services to the Boers. Each British brigade travelled with its own team of medical staff. Seven well-equipped hospital trains moved up and down the railway line closest to the battlefront. The main British hospital was at Nopurt. For more serious cases, hospital ships were stationed in the ports. <laughs> 
In the early part of the war, wounded British soldiers were given wine, champagne and beer in hospital. But when their British taxpayers started feeling the pinch, alcohol was taken off their free list of comforts. Another challenge for both armies was delivering mail to their soldiers. The British post office delivered about a million letters each week. On the Uppington route, camels were used. Feeding the troops was an even bigger challenge. The ox wagons could only carry a limited amount, so the troops had orders to commandeer all food. As they moved, the countryside was cleared of livestock. About 70 kilometers from Kimberley, on the main Cape Town Road, the two armies clashed again. The Boers had positioned themselves on the ridges at Khraspan, and the British made their usual frontal attack with flanking arms to encircle them. Watching the battle from the ridge just to the right of the main road was General Delaray. He noticed how difficult it was to shoot a running man from a hilltop. He decided a change in Boer tactics was necessary. The next natural defense line for the Boers was the confluence of the Ritt and Modder rivers. There was only one bridge crossing the river here. The small village of Rosmead, or Ritchie as it's now known, was on the northern bank. It was here that Delaray chose to make his stand. To prevent his men running away, he placed them on the British side of the river in trenches where the water trough is now situated. The bridge over the Modder was blown up. The British attack started over a wide front. Hidden in their trenches, the Boer view of the advancing soldiers was perfect. Well, it was a lovely morning and you never dreamt that anything was coming. You couldn't see nothing. But we were opened out, you know, five and six paces out, you know. And then the, 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 the four uh, very heavy fire on us. And we just moved up once after that and we lay there all day in, in the boiling sun. The Scots in kilts suffered most as the sun roasted the backs of their legs. We never saw Boer mark killed. They were very well uh, camouflaged in their very deep trenches and, on the, and with the trees, all in the trees. They saw us easy enough. We never saw them. Well, that went on for hours. We lay on our stomach there, weren't men getting shot occasionally if they moved. But there was a crucial weak link in Delaray's otherwise perfect plan, the weir over the Modder at Rosmead. Somebody had omitted to put enough men here, and the British made their breakthrough. Once they had crossed the river, the Boers had to retreat. That of it was that after the battle, I suffered far more, far more from uh, blistered, uh, the back of blistered knees. They were literally raw. So I begged a pair of ladies' stockings out of their little store there was at Mother River, cut off the feet and pulled them up over my, the back of my knees. And I didn't suffer from anything in the in Magus Fontaine, I can assure you. One or two fellows laughed at me. I said, yes, you try what it's like to have blistered back in the knees. You know, you, you don't mind doing something about it. About a week after Mother River, the British had a bigger problem on their hands in another corner of the Karoo. An Orange Free State commando had occupied the important junction at Stormberg. As remote as the junction was, the army's line of supply from the coast was threatened. 30 kilometers away at Maltino, the British decided to teach the Boers a lesson. They set out on a night march, but got lost, and by the time they reached Stormberg, the Boers were waiting for them. In the dim light of dawn, the British were easy targets. And there I found myself being covered by a boar actually aiming at me. I couldn't do anything. And the other, other man that I saw there was at the time, he had to put his rifle down. 90 men died and over 600 were taken prisoner. But within a few days, worse was to come for the British. One week later, Delaray was ready. His next line of defense was the range of hills at Marchesfontein. From the heights, he commanded a clear view of the British advance. If the Boers were to stop the juggernaut, it had to be here. On the 10th of December, the British guns opened up, straffing the top of Marchesfontein Ridge with their new high-explosive shells. 
But the Boers didn't worry. They watched the bombardment from the safety of trenches De La Rey had ordered them to dig along the base of the mountain. No one could survive there. Luckily, we lay safely in our trenches and the bombs flew over our heads. I don't believe a single Boer was hit. Anyway, they thought we were blown to pieces. But we knew an attack was imminent. Just after midnight, Scottish troops set out to surprise the Boers. In the dark, they got lost and discovered their mistake just as it was getting light. It was about this time that the Boers discovered them too. Once again, the survivors were pinned down, unable to move even a finger. That was a day, I think, when uh, there's been sovereigns offered for a drink of water, and a lot of people wouldn't believe that, but it happened in Africa, and not once, twice or thrice, a sovereign offered for a drink of water. At one stage, some Highlanders managed to climb Marcus Fontaine, but were overwhelmed by the Boers. When the battle was over, British casualties numbered over 900. 239 were dead. The monument to Scandinavians who died for the Boers shares the landscape. After the defeat at Marcus Fontaine, the British withdrew to the Morda River to wait for reinforcements. But with the fleet still at sea, the troops settled down to a long wait. The Chugela River in northern KwaZulu-Natal. When General Buller and the other half of the British force landed at Durban and started making their way inland, General Louis Buerta decided the Boers would need a strong position if they were to have a chance. He chose the Tugela River as a natural defensive line. At that time, the main road and railway line to Johannesburg passed through the village of Kalenza. From Buerta's perspective, the hills on one side of the river and open country on the other made Kalenzo an ideal position for the Boers. To make sure the British couldn't use their favorite means of transport to push past him, Boerta first had their railway bridge across the Tugela destroyed. Rocks were removed from all the drifts to make them unusable. The road bridge was left standing in the hope that the British would use it and make easy targets for the Boer marksmen. On the hills across the river from Kalenzo, Boerta ordered the Achterreyers to build stone walls and trenches. Logs were propped up in these to look like artillery guns. Then, on the banks of the Tugela, where the British least expected them, Boerta had the real trenches dug. His men dug at night and concealed the trenches very carefully. The 4,500 men Boerta had at his disposal were spread out along this defensive line. In a bold move, he also slung a bridge across the Tugela and placed men on the British side of the river, on Klangwani. While all this was going on, Buller's army was making its way towards Kalenzo. By the time it arrived, Buerta's trap was set. When Buller studied the Boer position from a low ridge a few kilometers back from the river, he and his staff took the bait, hook, line, and sinker. He signaled Ladysmith he was coming through and instructed his artillery to start shelling the high ridges where Buerta had placed his fake guns. At the same time, 15,000 British troops moved out in four prongs towards the river and the 4,500 men behind it. On the other side of the Tugela, the Boers watched the lines of infantry approach. But no one fired a shot. On the left of Buller's attack, the Irish brigade headed for a drift that was marked in this position on their maps. But their maps were wrong. It was here 
they continued marching, following the curve of the river, unaware they were being watched by hundreds of men in trenches on the bank immediately opposite. When the order was given to fire, it was a slaughter. Within two hours, more than 500 men were either dead or wounded. On the ridge, Buller was horrified, but there was not much he could do. The attack on the other flank was having problems as well. Behind the present-day power station, Buller's artillery battery was moving to a position in front of the eucalyptus trees so that it could give covering fire for the infantry attack. The guns had lined up where the yellow markers now stand and were preparing to fire. From behind their walls across the river, the Boers shot first. The Boers and Klangwani joined them and the British gunners fell like flies. The survivors ran to Adonga to hide from the bullets, leaving their guns behind. When an attempt was made to retrieve the guns, more men were killed. The death of one of these men would have a major impact on the Boers later. He was Freddie Roberts, son of the man who was about to be appointed Supreme Commander of the British forces in South Africa. Having lost more than 1,000 men in only a few hours, Buller gave the order to withdraw. The Boers had lost only 38. To add insult to injury, they sneaked across the together and took the British guns. They were soon on their way back to Pretoria. For the British, the defeat at Colenso, after Stormberg and Marchesfontein, set the seal on what became known as Black Week. The biggest and best equipped army Britain could muster had been defeated by farmers. A change of tactics was needed urgently. The man appointed to do the job was Field Marshal Lord Roberts. Already 67 years old, he was a veteran of more than 40 years campaigning in India. Having lost his son only days earlier in Colenso, he had a score to settle. Robert's chief of staff was Lord Kitchener, another very experienced soldier. To make sure things went right this time, the size of the army was doubled. Another 30,000 soldiers arrived from the colonies. Perhaps the war would not be over by Christmas after all. Soon after Buller arrived in South Africa, the strategically important Karoo town, Colesburg, was also touched by the war. The town was ideally situated for cutting off the British supply routes, so it was occupied by Boers. The British cavalry were sent to take the town. From the top of Colescorp, they decided a hill on the north side of town was the key to the position. Capturing it would cut off the Boers' supply route back to the Orange Free State over Norval's Pont. British troops attacked the position one night and were met by 200 Boers who were guarding the hill. Almost all their officers were killed before the British retreated. When reinforcements arrived from Cape Town, guns were manhandled to the top of Colescorp. Colesburg stayed in British hands from late February 1900 until the end of the war. Today, rocks still bear the graffiti of the troops. The first New Zealanders and Australians to die in the war lie buried here, alongside the main road. The drama of the following weeks, though, would relegate the sacrifices at Colesburg to obscurity. When Roberts and Kitchener arrived in Cape Town, the military situation for the British in South Africa was a disaster. Ladysmith, Kimberley and Mafeking were still besieged. The towns by this time had become symbols of British prestige, and it was unthinkable that they should fall to the Boers. Roberts urged Buller to stay on the defensive in Natal until the army could be reorganized. But Buller had decided to try another plan to get across the together. He was going to attack the end of the Boer line about 30 kilometers upstream. On the 20th of January, he began moving his troops from the British headquarters at Freer. The massive movements of troops and material made his intentions perfectly clear to General Louis Boerter. And by the time the British reached Trichard's Drift, which is now covered by Spionkorp Dam, 
the Boers were in position. A 30-kilometer line of trenches and fortifications had been prepared right across the British path. Directly in front of Buller's headquarters on Mount Alice, the highest mountain on the other side of the Tigella was Spionkorp. A pontoon bridge was thrown over the Tigella and the British crossed. On the evening of 23rd of January, it was decided to take Spionkorp. That night, 1,700 British troops set out from their camp below the mountain and climbed the spur that stretches out towards the dam. It was hard work in the dark, and to make the climb easier, the spades the men were carrying were dumped halfway up. It was a very high mountain, you know. It must have took us nearly an hour to get up there. And some places were sheer rock. You had to bunk one another up. It was about 4 a.m. when the British met the first resistance, a Boer sentry, who challenged them in the dark. He was quickly bayoneted, and then the British raced for the top. As the sun rose, the top of Spionkorp was shrouded in mist. A 400-meter trench was dug, with the few spades the men had between them. As the mist cleared, Ladysmith could be seen in the distance. But down in the Boer camp, when Louis Boerter heard the British had taken the mountain, he ordered his men into the attack. Up the steep slopes they went. Soon, men and artillery occupied the crests just below Spionkorp. On the peak to the right of the British trench, a pom-pom gun was hauled into position. While the drama was unfolding, the Carolina commando posed for a photograph. Within hours, 46 of them would be dead. Then they were ordered up the mountain. Their route brought them within meters of the British trench. The British fought from the inadequate cover they had prepared for themselves. At one stage, the Boers managed to get into the British trench, but were driven back. And then the shelling started. From the ridges all round, thousands of shells rained down on the British position. It was that uh, Boer's pom-pom gun that was doing all the damage there. And uh, one officer, I know he, uh, <coughs> he wanted us to charge, see? One of our officers, it was, uh, what was his name now? I can't remember his names now. And uh, I know we all got up to charge. Fixed bayonets? Fixed bayonets, yeah. And he, uh, of course, he went down. He only just went down there, but five or six bullets hit him. Of course, that stopped the charge. There wasn't a second without shells bursting. Where I was, it wasn't so bad. But on the other side, hell, man, that was bad. They were shooting like hell. At that time, we still had one of the old pom-poms. You know, one of those pom-pom machine guns. But he never did more than three shots, and then he jammed. In my section, the only thing you could hear was the constant noise of the rifle bolts. Rifle bolts going all the time. By mid-morning, the situation was desperate. Reinforcements were sent up simply to be blown to pieces. The British gunners were helpless. They were situated so far down the mountain, they couldn't see the Boer guns. From Mount Alice, Buller watched the bombardment in despair. His communications officers tried to run a field telephone up the mountain to make contact with the officer in command, but it didn't work. Eventually, Churchill ran up the mountain twice during the day to report on the battle. At one stage, troops were sent up the steep sides of Twin Peaks to silence the pom-pom gun. They succeeded, but through a misunderstanding, were recalled. In besieged Ladysmith, the townsfolk waited in hope as the sounds of the battle carried across the felt. But at the mountain, 
It was clear from the steady stream of wounded being brought back down that a terrible mistake had been made at the beyond. Just how terrible became clear a few days later when the dead were buried. 322 British soldiers died that day. 300 were taken prisoner. After the battle, the British were given the order to withdraw and the Boers reclaimed the hill. The dead were simply buried in the trenches in which they tried to cling to life. The enemies were buried around them. As the reality of Spioncorp dawned, it was clear to the British soldiers that there would be many more lonely graves on hilltops before this war was over. It's been written about in thousands of books, from official histories to personal memoirs. Statues and monuments to the courage and high ideals that emanated from it have been erected around the world. The voices of veterans have been recorded so they can speak to us from the grave. It was the first war captured on film, and supposedly it was a gentleman's war. Fought between an empire at the height of its power and two tiny republics. It was the South African War, otherwise known as the Anglo-Boer War. And it began 100 years ago. At first glance, the declaration of war looked like sheer madness. But a quick strike at Dundee, followed by sieges at Kimberley, Ladysmith and Mafeking, stopped the British Army in its tracks. More troops were poured into South Africa, but a brilliant change in Boer tactics led to crushing defeats at Marhusfontein, Storenburg and Colenso. It seemed the British Army would never cross the Tugela. Finally, a mountain called Spionkop became immortalized in British military history as more than 300 soldiers died in a single terrible day of misjudgment. It would go down as the heaviest bombardment in the entire Anglo-Boer War. Almost 10,000 shells rained down in three days. For his third attempt to get his army across the Jigela, the British general, Buller, decided the key was an unobtrusive hill alongside the N3 toll road to Durban, known as Fahl Krantz. Here, the barrier of hills was at its narrowest, with open country beyond. Prior to the battle, Buller had identified Swartkorn on the British side of the river as an ideal position for his artillery. A road was constructed to the top of the hill and 14 guns were hauled onto the summit. His engineers built a pontoon bridge and his troops crossed the Tugela. To relieve the siege of Ladysmith, they would have to get through the Boers' 30-kilometer line of trenches and fortifications. As the British troops advanced towards the Boers under cover of the river bank, 72 guns on the plain and from the top of Swartkop opened up an intense bombardment on the Boer position. As shells smashed down onto the Boers, rocks shattered on the hilltop. By four o'clock that afternoon, the British troops were climbing Falklands. But when they reached the ridge, the Boers had fallen back to an even stronger position. The battle continued into the following day, until Buller decided the effort was futile and ordered a withdrawal. The British had lost 164 men, the Boers 38. Against a very much smaller army than his, in his third attempt at crossing the Tugela, Buller had failed yet again. In Ladysmith, by this time, the situation had become desperate. The siege was into its third month, and typhoid was claiming lives daily in the town. 
it had not been a very happy New Year. The Boers had become tired of camping on the hills and had begun another plan to force the town to surrender. With the town lying in a natural basin, they decided to flood it by blocking the Clip River where it leaves the valley. They began building a dam and for both sides, the race was on. On the western front at Marchesfontein, the tide was to turn against the Boers. After a standoff of nearly two months, the British reinforcements had reached Morda River. After assessing the situation, Roberts and Kitchener made their first move in the war by invading the Orange Free State. The cavalry of 5,000 were sent on a giant loop that bypassed Marchesfontein, while the infantry followed on foot. After clearing Cronier's position, Kimberley was relieved after 124 days of siege. So hard had the cavalry ridden to the town, the men were exhausted. But their horses suffered terribly along the route. Behind them lay the carcasses of hundreds of horses. The situation for Cronier was now desperate. Suddenly his trenches at Marchesfontein were useless, and he had the British behind him as well. He decided to run for Bloemfontein before they could seize his 400 wagons. Following the Moda River, his five-mile-long convoy made its cumbersome journey. With barely a day's rest in Kimberley, the cavalry gave chase. Below a mountain called Paderberg, they caught up. Cronier's column was queuing in the narrow road at the drift, waiting to cross the Moda, when the first shells from the British guns burst on their position. Some of the wagons escaped, but then the gunners found their range. Soon, artillery appeared on all the ridges and more British troops arrived. Cronier ordered his men to dig in. Caves were dug into the riverbank for the women and children, and the men prepared to fight. In a fit of madness, Kitchener ordered his troops into a frontal attack across the open plain. 330 died, more than on any other day of the war. At one stage, General Christian de Vett forced the British off one of the ridges and held an escape route open for Crenier, but he refused to move. Then, the shelling started. After 10 days, with his lager shattered around him, Crenier surrendered with 4,000 men. This was a quarter of the Orange Free State forces. But it was a bittersweet victory for the British. The thirsty troops drank from the Morda during the bombardment, but unbeknown to them, Dead animals in the Boer camp had polluted the water. When Bloemfontein surrendered two weeks later, British soldiers were dying like flies as typhoid raged through their ranks. Cronier's defeat was seen by many Boers as a sign of God's displeasure with their involvement in the war. This was undoubtedly the thinking that uh, if you were winning, you were obviously doing the right things. If you were losing, you must in some way have upset uh, the Almighty. And this obviously not only produced a, a practical defeat, but it produced a psychological defeat as well. Paderberg had its biggest impact hundreds of kilometers away at Colenso in Natal. General Buller was making his fourth attempt at crossing the Tugela. He started by pushing the Boers back from the ridges they held on the British side of the river. As the British surged forward, the Boers retreated across the sleeper bridge they had lain over the Tugela some months before. Realizing a crack could appear in his line, General Buerta ordered his men to dig trenches. Fortifications were erected. His artillery was installed where it could be most effective. Facing his 6,000 men on the hills across the river were 78 heavy guns and 28,000 British troops. Under the covering fire of a heavy bombardment, the British crossed the Tugela yet again. This time, though, Buller was determined there would be no retreat. The battle raged for more than two weeks on and around the copies on the northern bank of the river, with both sides suffering heavy losses, but neither giving an inch. But it was during the battle for a hill that became known as Hart's Hill that the Boers 
finally cracked. For the second day in succession, the British started their advance toward the hill from the banks of the Tugela. As they moved through the hail of bullets flying down at them from the hill, news of Cronier's defeat at Paderburg reached the Boers. Their line weakened and then broke. It was a rout. After four months of trying, the British had finally made it across the Tugela. Amongst the dead and wounded in the Boer trenches, they made a startling discovery. Two Boer women who had fought alongside their husbands. The one, a Mrs. Krantz, was dead, and the other, Helena Wagner, was wounded. Next morning, behind the present-day Peters Hill industrial area at Ladysmith, plumes of dust rose high into the sky as a long line of Boer wagons raced back to the Transvaal. I saw General Joubert standing on the bridge at Sonnas River, trying to stop the burghers, trying to stop them, trying to organize them again and show defense. But he couldn't succeed. They pushed him aside, really. They really pushed him aside. And I remember the words he said, may the heavens fall upon you. He was so disappointed. Again, there was there again the lack of discipline to listen to the commanders. The dam the Boers had been erecting to flood the town had been started just one month too late. That afternoon, British troops entered Ladysmith with their prisoners to a tumultuous welcome. The siege, after 118 days, was finally over. After two months in Bloemfontein, the disease that had decimated the British troops was under control, and they set out for Pretoria. From the Boers' point of view, there seemed no way now of stopping the juggernaut. But en route, there was another important destination, Mafeking, which was still being besieged by the Boers. By this time, baden Powell was a hero in Britain. His dispatches from the town were eagerly read in the British press. In Mafeking, money had been printed featuring him on the face, and there were stamps with him instead of the Queen. At Christmas, Riesel's Hotel featured a menu with 30 items on it, and a party was held for 250 of the town's white children. But not everyone was having fun. Several thousand black people in Mafeking faced starvation. Horses were slaughtered, and soup kitchens started. Stray dogs were shot for them to eat, but for many, even these methods weren't enough. The day after Christmas, an African man, Inos Mobalo, was sentenced to death for stealing a goat. Incidents like these would have an impact on South Africa in later years. The interpreter at the trial was Sol Pleike, who later became first secretary of the South African Native National Congress, forerunner of the ANC. Pleike found that the the money that came from Britain, 29,000 pounds, as compensation for loss of property and so on during the siege, not a penny of that went to the Baralong, um, despite their suffering uh, to a far greater extent than that of the uh, English in the town. This, this made him into an angry young man. The most enduring legacy of the siege developed from the cadet corps that had been started in Mafeking before the war to keep young boys off the street. They ran messages for the soldiers, and some, like little Frankie Brown, paid the ultimate price. baden Powell seized on the concept when he later started the international scout movement. When British troops entered Mafeking in May, the news was greeted in London with excitement out of all proportion to the importance of the town or the event. On the 31st of May, 1900, British troops entered Johannesburg. All available beds were commandeered and guns were positioned in the Hillbrow Fort. Pazadenote Park became the soldiers' horse depot. Most important of all, as soon as the Union Jack was raised, Milner urged Roberts to get the mines going again and take the strain off the British taxpayer. Roberts was being pressured greatly by Lord Milner to reopen the mines. Um, in fact, if you look at the correspondence, this is the most consistent plea from Milner. 
which I think will show that there was a great deal of involvement uh, on the part of the mining companies, not only to bring about the war, but during the war. President Kruger and his government left Pretoria for the Northern Transvaal. Africans burnt their passes and there was wide-scale looting when the British troops entered Pretoria a week later. Just outside Pretoria, on the main road to Whitbank, is the range of mountains known as Donkerhook. It was a perfect defensive position, and it was here that Werther chose to make his stand. If Roberts could destroy the Boers here, the end of war would become reality. The battle was fought over a front of almost 30 kilometers, with the heavy artillery pounding the ridge for two days. The British breakthrough finally came at a small, insignificant copy at the end of the line called Diamond Hill, which was being held by the Kemp and Fulyun commandos. The cold stream guards surged up the hill and the Boer line broke. A few weeks later, in the area just behind Clarence, known as the Brandwater Basin, General Martinez Prinzluer and 4,000 men surrendered. It was a heavy blow for the Republics. Weapons were handed in and burnt on Surrender Hill. And today, a hundred years later, still nothing grows on the spot. A month later, at Belfast, the last big battle of the war took place. More than 19,000 British troops against 4,000 Boers. Even so, it took seven days before the Boer army melted away, taking their long tom guns with them. In the midst of the chaos and defeat, Kruger slipped over the border at Kamatipurt and boarded a ship sent by the Queen of the Netherlands. In Europe, he was greeted by enthusiastic crowds wherever he went. It was scenes like these that had misled the Boers before the war. They thought Europeans would come to their aid if war was declared. They learned the hard way. In Europe, only sympathy is free. Kruger went into exile in Switzerland never again to see the land that he loved so much. Back in Johannesburg and Pretoria, as the weapons were handed in, trains started arriving at Park Station, and the cricket resumed at the Wanderers. Life started returning to normal. The year of war was over, or at least that's what everyone thought. Out in the felt, Boers who'd refused to surrender were planning new methods of carrying the war to the British, methods that would change South Africa in ways no one could ever have imagined. As the first year of the new century drew to a close, South Africa was burning. The war had taken a dramatic new turn. Commandos would appear out of nowhere and leave a trail of destruction in their wake. Slowly but surely, the British Army's lines of communication and routes of supply were grinding to a standstill. It seemed all the soldiers ever did know was repair infrastructure. With all its resources and reserves, the British Army had no answer to this new type of warfare. Frustrated by his inability to fight on these new terms, Roberts struck back. Arguing that the Boers were being supported by local civilians, he decreed that all civilians in the vicinity of Boer damage would be held responsible. As punishment, their homes would be destroyed. British soldiers moved across the countryside, forcing Boer families out of their homes and ignoring all pleas, burnt their houses to the ground. At the end of the year, more than 30,000 homes had been destroyed. It was a legacy that would come back to haunt South Africa. 
the British Army had effectively targeted the Boer women and children. For some troops, though, it wasn't easy at first. When they get there to carry out their task, there is a wife there, there are children there, and they are obviously devastated. And the troopers, including Trooper Bisley, are overcome by the circumstance, and they don't carry out their task. Some months later, the wars become a lot more grim. He is prepared to go out and to participate in house burning. Matters weren't helped either when the British started using Africans to assist with looting the houses before the arson took place. Prized family possessions were either stolen in front of their owners or carted off to be sold on auction. The monies earned were used to fund the war effort. The bitterness would endure for decades. As the farm burnings continued, more and more destitute families huddled out in the felt with nothing. There were reports of rape. Roberts hoped the sight of these victims would convince the Boers to stop fighting. It had completely the opposite effect. Towns left unguarded were invaded by commandos, and Boers that had surrendered were harassed. To protect them, so-called refugee camps were set up. Almost from the outset, destitute women were forced to look for shelter in them, simply because they had nowhere else to go. There were 10 camps in South Africa when Roberts handed command over to Lord Kitchener. But the destruction continued. Transport columns had to be more and more heavily guarded wherever they traveled. To travel in a small column was to invite disaster. To make matters worse, General Christian de Wett carried the war into the Cape in the hope of stirring up an Afrikaner rebellion. But few Cape Afrikaners felt strongly enough about the problems up north to join. He turned his attention instead to attacking small garrisons. But with nowhere to keep prisoners, they had to be set free. In the eastern Transvaal, General Louis Boerta, who had ironically been one of the pacifists opposed to the war, was wreaking havoc. Even though he was married to an English woman, this didn't prevent his house being blown up by the British. As the guerrilla war gained momentum, both sides began relying on Africans for information, and slowly but surely, they were dragged into the conflict on both sides. By the time the war ended, about 100,000 Africans would be actively involved. I think one of the myths that has been perpetuated in recent history is that the relationship between black and white on the farms was hostile. Maybe it was in some cases, but I think the British greatly feared that the black people on the farms would be loyal to the Boers. Many black people were taking the, the cattle of their masters into Pasutuland and other places. So, Kitchener, in, in, on December 21st, 1900, in, in a most significant document, uh, Army Circular Number 29, said that the Boer women and children in those areas where the Boer commandos are active must be removed, everything must be destroyed, and the natives, as, as he termed them, must also be removed for fear that they will either voluntarily or involuntarily um, assist the Boers. Thus began the first of many forced removals in South Africa's history. Every single person was rounded up and taken to what had now become known as the concentration camps. African servants went along with their employers. On the farms, the British troops slaughtered every animal they could not use themselves. It was hoped the scorched earth policy would remove all possible support for the fighting commandos. Even rural Africans who had absolutely nothing to do with the war were rounded up and taken to Kitchener's newly created black concentration camps. To make sure the Boers couldn't use what the Africans left behind, their homesteads were burnt. For many of these people, the move would change their social fabric forever.
British taxpayers, by this stage asking questions about the cost of the war, there was an ulterior motive to Kitchener's plan as well. They wanted to save, they said, 10,000 pounds a month that it would cost to uh, feed the blacks. They didn't want to feed them, so they put them on farms and required them to grow crops, and also to grow food for the army departments. As the countryside was cleared of people and animals, it became harder and harder for the Boers in the felt. What they did was to go to remote areas on kopjes or valleys, plant their crops there, hide their livestock there, and then make sure that they provide for themselves. Before long, they had to rely on their own ingenuity. For coffee, they burnt mealies, maize, and then filtered that into their mugs. And with regard to tobacco, they used dry peach leaves or cloths that they dipped into sheep dip because there was some nicotine in sheep dip. With De Vette using the small town of Lindley as his base, Kitchener had the entire town, including its churches, burnt to the ground. But in spite of the hardships, the commandos carried on fighting. Clearing the countryside was only part of Kitchener's plan. To protect his supply lines, he ordered blockhouses to be built along the railway lines. Some were magnificent multi-storey structures. Most were built of corrugated iron and sandbags. Each blockhouse was built within sight and rifle shot of the next. They were joined by lines of barbed wire. Within a few months, more than 8,000 reached across the countryside, effectively dividing South Africa into giant paddocks. To guard the blockhouses, garrisons of African, colored, or Indian troops were recruited, swelling the numbers involved in the war enormously. To clear the countryside of Boers once and for all, Lines of British soldiers extending up to 90 kilometers long moved across the countryside, pushing the Boers up against the blockhouse lines. Very soon, the numbers of Boers captured began to mount. The British could finally see who they were fighting. The prisoners of war were sent away to concentration camps on St. Helena, Ceylon, Bermuda, and in India. Here, life for them became one of routine and boredom. Many took up craft work, and their legacy remains in dozens of museums in South Africa today. Some of the prisoners weren't content to sit out the war in camp. Jail de Villiers, the man responsible for the dam in Ladysmith, learnt Hindi and disguised himself as an Indian to escape from camp in India. But for prisoners in the concentration camps in South Africa, the situation deteriorated. By 1901, there were 116 camps holding more than a quarter of a million people. Overcrowded and disorganized, it was simply a matter of time before disaster struck. As more and more people were brought in, they brought with them diseases. And soon, scarlet fever, measles, TB and typhoid raged like fire through the camps. By the end of the war, the camps would claim more than 27,000 Boer lives, 85% of them children. This figure would be more than double the number of soldiers killed. The number of Africans that died in the concentration camps would probably never be known. From the records that still exist and grave sites that are only now being discovered, such as this one at Brunfort, with 650 unmarked graves, it appears that at least 17,000 Africans died. I have conservatively said that there were 20,000 deaths. I believe there were 30,000 deaths at Heidelberg. There was no medical care, no food provided. The men were working in the mines in Johannesburg. They were eating dead horses. They were dying at the rate of one day, but there's no death register. The fact that the number of dead wasn't higher can be attributed to an Englishwoman, Emily Hobhouse, who was given permission to visit the concentration camps in 1901. Shocked by what she saw, her campaign against Kitchener and the British Army 
so embarrassed the government that conditions in the camps improved drastically and the death rate dropped. Afrikaners would respect her forever afterwards, and her reburial at the Women's Monument in Bloemfontein was attended by thousands of people. But even though many Boers laid down arms when they heard of the suffering in the camps, there were others who were determined to fight on to the bitter end. They had heard that wives, children had died in the concentration camps, that their farms had been destroyed, that they had lost, lost all, their, all, all their cattle. They had, from a material point of view, very little, if, if anything, to lose. And that was one of the reasons why many of them, I think, actually continued fighting. By late 1901, when the sweeps in the Transvaal and Free State were making life difficult for the Boers, a number of commandos invaded the Cape again. It was a desperate last attempt to drum up support from Cape Afrikaners. But with so many mouths to feed, they soon became unpopular wherever they went, and only a few men joined up. British columns and installations were raided. The small Karoo town of Richmond was attacked twice by a commando looking for supplies. And although the attack was repulsed, a number of local men were killed. Town guards were established, along with companies of colonial troops, to respond to the threat. They chased the commandos relentlessly. There was constant skirmishing, and some commandos had to move camp twice a day. The colonials knew the countryside and had a communications network to back them up. In spite of this, one commando reached Sir Lowry's Pass. Cape Town was put on full alert, and troops were stationed on Devil's Peak. The tiny West Coast mission, Lilyfontein, suffered a revenge attack by a commando led by Marnie Moritz. 30 men were murdered in front of the church. Even remote Okip felt the impact of the Boers. It was besieged for a month by Jan Smuts and his men. At the time, the town had the richest copper mine in the world, and Smuts hoped besieging it would draw troops away from the Cape. But the Boers knew they were coming to the end of the line. More and more of them were being captured, and the winter of 1901, which was the coldest in memory, didn't help matters either. One burger wrote in his diary, I've patched my patches of patches with patches of patches. They also used animal skin in the guerrilla phase for their clothes. There's this lovely inscription in a diary of a man watching their group fleeing over a mountain. And he said they all looked like a parade of cannibals off to a costume party. Some Boers took to wearing captured British uniforms, but this only made their problems worse. If they caught any of the uh, Boers wearing khaki uniforms, they would then execute them. A person who was caught was, for instance, Jack Baxter, who was executed near um, at Hoverman's Play in Aberdeen. He was blind, almost blind, and he rode into the British forces in a snowstorm. Matters finally came to a head for the Cape Boers when leaders like Gideon Schiepers and Hannes Lothar were sentenced to death for treason and war crimes. It was now truly time to stop. In April 1901, Kitchener called a truce, and Boers from all corners of the felt arrived in Vereniging to discuss their options. While they were talking, an event took place near Freyheit at Hallkrantz, or Umtashana, as the Zulus call it, which would have a significant impact on the Boers' decision to stop fighting, as well as future race relations in South Africa. On the 1st of May 1902, the Boers bent down a mizi, or homestead, of the Bakulusi people, and confiscating about 4,000 head of cattle, 3,800 sheep, and then uh, they, the, the Zulu people decided to arm to recapture the stock. The Boers had the cattle in a kraal just below the mountain. No sentries have been posted, and at sunrise, the Zulus attacked. One of the survivors, Francis Pratt, later related the story of what happened. He lay dead still against the wall, and the Zulus jumped into this kraal and stabbed all and sundry, including his friend next to him. In a moment of, of clear-thoughtedness, he grabbed his friend's body and put it over him. He knew his friend was dead. And as the Zulus went past, he said on six occasions he felt the Asagai go into his friend's body. But he lay dead still. The Zulu wave passed over them. When he realized it was clear, he jumped this remnant of a wall and headed down into the 
uh, uh, area below us which was covered with reeds and morass, and he lay in the water there until the morning. 56 Boers and 53 Zulus died in the battle. The news of the attack sent a shockwave through Boer ranks. Louis Boerter described it as the foulest deed of the war, uh, and is supposed to have said that um, it, it did raise for the Boers, as doubtless for the British, the specter of the war becoming, uh, an, at least in part, an ethnic conflict between black and white. At Melrose House in Pretoria at 11 p.m. the 31st of May 1902, the Boer and British delegates met to sign the peace treaty. Kitchener of Khartoum, he wrote. Sir Alfred Milner merely wrote, Milner. Lord Kitchener went round, shaking each Boer's hand in the room. We're good friends now, he said. And they all left the room. The morning after peace was declared, everyone woke up to a new South Africa. Across the country, the terms of the treaty were read out to stunned crowds. There were Thanksgiving services. President Steyn of the Orange Free State and the other Boer generals toured the concentration camps, explaining the terms of the peace to everyone. In Freire Fort Camp, they planted a tree to mark the occasion. As the news reached out across the felt, the bitter enders started returning to the towns. All of a sudden they heard that they had lost their independence, which was the major thing that they were fighting for. So, although many burghers kept their faith by saying, this was the will of God, and it's in his time, he will give us back our freedom. There were some of those burghers who shook their fists and said, I've lost my faith in God. Hundreds of thousands of weapons had to be handed in and destroyed. One old Umi, as we call him, said, oh no, what? I've taken this, this rifle from the carcass of old Medford. I'll just go and hand it back to them. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see? Yeah. But others, no. More than a quarter of a million people had to be sent home from the concentration camps. They were given a month's supply of mealy meal and left to fend for themselves. Even though a small amount of compensation had been offered by the British government, it was hopelessly inadequate. Thousands of people returned to farms on which there was nothing. No house, no livestock, not even fruit trees. In many families, there was no husband either. It would take some of them generations to recover. No, at the end of the war, when I came back here, I was the first to arrive on our farm. I had a feeling of futility. Why did it have to happen? A feeling of despair. A feeling of inferiority. I felt, why couldn't God have ordained things better? More than 30,000 prisoners of war had to be returned from camps overseas. In terms of the peace treaty, they had to sign an oath of allegiance to the crown. Some refused and stayed on in India and Ceylon. Even today, a herd of Boer cattle still roams wild in one of the game reserves in Sri Lanka. Another group of Boers emigrated to Argentina rather than serve under the British. In Commodore Rivadaria, they still form a prominent section of the community. There is a lot of us who have been able to get back to South Africa. And I think always that South Africa is South Africa is a paradise. This is the most land in the world, this is the best. Alles is better in South Africa. Ons het gewond geword, ons het goed het geword met die idee. For some people, the peace was bad news. The almost half a million British soldiers in South Africa and inflow of British money to fund the war effort had created an economic boom in some parts of the country. As they packed up to go home, the money dried up. 
and large stocks of unused supplies flooded the market. All the work that had been available was gone, and crime increased. Property values declined in Durban and in Peter Maritzburg by between 20 and 30 percent in the years immediately following the war. There were many shop premises that stood empty, uh, and there was actually some emigration on the part of whites in the urban centres, uh, mainly to Australia and to some extent to South America. Uh, Natal went into a long-term post-war recession which she didn't really come out of until just before Union, round about 1909. Of all groups, Africans came off worst after the war. African soldiers had fought for the British in the hope of recovering their land, livestock and civil rights. They rightly expected to share in the benefits of the peace. But the British did an about turn. As part of the peace terms, Kitchener left the fate of the African population to the Boers. When the war came to an end, there was a lot of hardship for the Zulu people because they, 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 their homestead had been burnt down and they had no material to rebuild them and they had also no compensation. And uh, those who were prominent leaders of the war were demoted 1902 by the British now, replaced by others. To compensate themselves for their losses in the war, many Africans simply claimed ancestral land from returning Boers. Even Louis Boerta was chased off his farm. The British quickly reissued their enemies with guns so that they could get their farms back, and the Africans were right back where they started. More than 120,000 black and colored people fought on the side of the British, nearly half of them in, in a combatant capacity. At the end of the Anglo-Boer War, they, they received no political rights whatsoever. As a matter of fact, in due course, those black and coloured people in the Cape Colony and in Natal who had political rights, had their political rights taken away from them. And I think one must, one must understand, or one, one cannot understand the political history of South Africa and political developments in South Africa in the course of the 20th century if one does not keep in mind what happened during the Anglo-Boer War, especially as far as the participation of black and colored people were concerned. In other words, I think that one cannot understand why the African National Congress was, was established on the 8th of January 1912 if one does not see it against the background of the Anglo-Boer War. Black South Africans, in more than one way, were the losers in this war. The black disappointment is most probably best verbalized by Chief Segale of the Katle, who stated in 1903, if there was to be a war again, the inhabitants of the Transvaal would support the Boers simply because the British haven't delivered on their promises. The war was not a happy experience for the British Army. Planning and management were almost non-existent. They had budgeted 25,000 horses for the war. This number was thought to be enough to see them through any war. Eventually, they were forced to buy more than 500,000 horses. Of these, more than 360,000 died. 5,000 horses were left to starve on farms near Burgersdorf. In the first 15 months of the war, more than 70,000 trek oxen were either killed or died. The peace had cost 22,000 British lives, most of whom had died from disease. It had required half a million British soldiers to end the war and cost the British taxpayer 220 million pounds, a far cry from the 10 million pounds that had been budgeted. Boer losses were tremendous. In addition to their homes and private property, about 10% of the population of the two Boer republics had died in the war. Of these, four-fifths had died of disease in the concentration camps, while about 6,000 died on commando or as prisoners of war. For Africans, the suffering and struggle had been in vain. A grant from the British government allowed white farms to be rebuilt, although Africans were hardly compensated at all. Coloured people also suffered terribly. Both sides had shot them as spies or robbed them of their crops and livestock. Their houses and villages were burnt down. Their service and assistance in Britain's victory was neither acknowledged nor awarded. The Cape Copper Company at O'Keep 
awarded its own medal to staff who had defended the town. Ironically, it's now one of the most sought-after medals. The war had heralded the new technological age. Military communications were revolutionized with the use of the field telephone and radio. X-rays came into general use. It was the first media war with mass circulation of newspapers and cinematography. Thousands of books were written about it. Paper money was issued for the first time by both sides during the war. The methods of warfare were changed forevermore. Smokeless gunpowder and trenches that had been used so successfully by the Boers were adopted by all sides when the First World War broke out a decade later. Cavalry charges became extinct. After three years of war, life for English and Afrikaans-speaking people in South Africa returned to normal, almost. They sought each other out as friends in an upwelling of reconciliation. The only people who had problems were Afrikaners who had surrendered or supported the British. They were ostracized as joiners. For two, three generations after the war, the sentiment against the joiners was very, very negative. The joiners even had to establish their own scout church, which uh, continued until 1907. And it was, it was only the efforts of men like Louis Boerta that reconciled the joiners and the bitter enders. But for a long time afterwards, Afrikaners were reminded there on that farm lives the family, the descendants of joiners. Generally, though, there was an air of optimism everywhere as people helped rebuild the shattered country. In the period between 1902 and 1910, uh, the phrase the new South Africa was used very much by the interests which were uh, pushing for the creation of union. And what the new South Africa meant uh, in that period was harmony, harmony between the races. And the races meant Dutch and English. And there was a lot of emphasis on the importance of language equality, on the importance of improving education, on the importance of uh, cultural renewal and building a new kind of unified, pacified national entity. But the new entity overlooked a substantial portion of the population. For their contribution in the war, African soldiers had received no medals. The scale tipped briefly toward equality for them in 1905, when the Transvaal Supreme Court ruled they could own land. The scales swung sharply back when Union came in 1910 and racist laws were introduced. Four years later, when the First World War broke out, African soldiers again offered their services in the hope that more sacrifices would win them their rights in due course. But wounds from the Anglo-Boer War would soon reopen in South African society and deny them their rights for nearly a century. When the war started, Generals Boerter and Smuts offered South Africa support to Britain. Afrikaans society erupted in a rebellion that pitted Boer War generals against one another. 120 people died and more than 6,000 were arrested before the rebellion was crushed. But it was not before a tiny flame of nationalism had been lit that would grow over the coming decades. By 1931, only nine Afrikaans books had been published on the Anglo-Boer War. But after the commemoration of the Great Trek, the floodgates opened. The vision of a country free of British domination gripped the public mind. Boer heroes rose up out of the dust to fight once more, and a new history was born. First generation participated in the war. They preferred to forget about the horrors of war. But it's the second generation that actually uses the war as a political reservoir. This history was very selective. The black camps were not mentioned at all. And um, the, the implication of that history, which uh, Don Marmoni has called a sacred history, is that the only people that suffered in the war were the Boer people. And I want to make it clear, the Boer people suffered greatly. And for their population, they suffered more than anybody else as far as the number of deaths. But it is really a distortion of history to say that others did not suffer. When South Africa became a republic in 1961, the flame of nationalism became a raging fire that would burn for more than 30 years. 
it would leave South Africa with a legacy in which today more people die violent deaths each year than died during three years of full-scale combat in the Anglo-Boer War. Through it all, the original Republican ideal of the Boer Republics has endured, cherished by albeit smaller numbers of Boers. One could draw a line from the Anglo-Boer War, the devastation in areas like the Western Transvaal or the Northern Northeastern Free State, and the development of right-wing pol right politics in South Africa. I, Nelson After the first democratic elections held in South Africa in 1994, some Boers felt so strongly about change, they headed for remote areas to establish towns like Oranya to build the new world their forefathers could not achieve. The imagined pain of the Anglo-Boer War still lives deep in their hearts. During the 1998 visit of the British Prime Minister Tony Blair to South Africa, they demanded reparations for the Anglo-Boer War. For most South Africans today, the Anglo-Boer War is a wall on a hillside, a cross on a mountaintop, an old cartridge in the felt. It was a war that was entirely avoidable, but at every turning point on the road that led to it, nobody turned. It tore us apart and forged us into a nation and created a new set of rules that lasted almost 100 years. Today, as the graves of the fallen are systematically plundered for souvenirs, as name plaques are stolen and sold as scrap metal, as monuments are defaced, the history slips further.